Hi there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. Shannon O'Neill is with us. Shannon O'Neill is a vice president, deputy director of studies of the Council on Foreign Relations. She's also a senior fellow at the council. She's written a fascinating article for Foreign Affairs magazine on the stretch out in the supply chain. Why are we seeing empty supermarket shelves? Why do we see runaway inflation? Shannon O'Neill will tell us, is it all COVID or is it something else? We are very much pleased to welcome Shannon O'Neill to the program. Shannon, welcome back. Uh, we're delighted to have you back on the show. And uh, everybody is talking about your article in Foreign Affairs on the stretch out in the supply chain. In fact, everyone's talking about the stretch out in the supply chain and the inflation and the tanking of the stock market. Now, your beat has uh, classically been South America. Uh, and now uh, you're uh, writing this incisive article for foreign affairs about the supply chain. Is this mission creep or how did you get into the supply chain? Well, Jim, it's great to be back uh, with you and discussing this. And, you know, interestingly, the reason or the way I, I got into this was almost five years ago at the Council on Foreign Relations where I work, I directed a task force on North America. And so we looked at the ties between Mexico, the United States, and Canada, whether they're economic ties, security ties, personal ties, energy ties, all kinds of different issues. And when I was doing the research for that, I got really interested in the economic ties and particularly the commercial ties. And over the last 25, 30 years, not just the trade that's gone back and forth between those three countries, but the building up of North American supply chains. Uh, so I started looking at that. And then as I started looking at those, I started looking at supply chains all over the world. So looking at Asian supply chains, European supply chains, and then how they compare to North America and how important those were around the world. So that's something I've been doing for the last almost five years now. Uh, and, and have really gotten interested in. And so it fits, you know, looking up the Western Hemisphere, we're a big part of that world and we're a big part of these regional hubs, one of the big regional hubs and supply chains, but not the most integrated one, frankly. Uh, and so looking at the last 40, 50 years, the rise of Asia, the integration of Europe, and those are two places that have made, I would say, more of supply chains and the power of integration uh, for competitiveness, for productivity, for making things better, faster, cheaper, uh, than we really have here in North America. So that's where all of this came from and why I'm writing about it in foreign affairs today. Yes. So the last five years, if I can remember back that far, uh, the supermarket uh, was, shelves were filled with produce and other products that I wanted to buy, anyone wanted to buy, and uh, the food was affordable. And uh, now uh, we seem to have gone into a tailspin. Now, uh, What's happened? So over these last two years of COVID, we have seen a set uh, of- COVID, COVID is what happened. COVID is part of what happened, not just- Part of what happened. Part of, what's ah, happened, right? part of what happened. So tell us what is accounted for by COVID and what's accounted for by anything else. Right, so we have seen sort of three different kinds of shocks. We've seen supply shocks. So factories shut down, people went didn't go to work because they were sick or unable to go, borders closed and the like. We have seen transportation shocks, right? We see this where things aren't moving around, ports get closed, uh, passenger flights aren't flying and lots of stuff used to go in the bottom of those passenger planes along with your luggage, used to go all sorts of freight and cargo. And so when there's fewer of them in the air, there's less going back and forth across oceans. Uh, we've seen lots of shocks on that, but I would say the biggest shock, particularly over this last year, that worries you in those supermarkets and, and you know, as you were trying to you know, buy presents over the holidays and the like, is the demand shock. And an interesting aspect of this COVID, uh, the COVID, re not recession, but the COVID sort of surge of the last year has been that as people went home and sat at their computers, they bought a lot of stuff and particularly Americans. So over this last year, Americans have bought almost a trillion dollars more worth of goods, all kinds of goods, computers and clothing and construction materials and electronics and the like, but almost a trillion dollars more than they bought in 2019 before we'd ever heard of COVID. And part of the challenge for supply chains is trying to move a trillion dollars more worth of goods through US supply chains that you know, would have been strained under the best of times. And because of the supply shocks, the transportation shocks, it's not the best of times here in the United States. So were Americans buying over the internet? Uh, if they had worried about COVID, they wouldn't have gone 
to the supermarket, uh, and they wouldn't have gone to specialty stores, which will probably close anyway. Uh, <laughs> so uh, how are they buying and what so are they big, buying? Yeah, a big surge was was e-commerce. So people were buying online. People were still going to stores. So as you say, there's fewer of them around than there were lots closed during during the you know depths of the recession. Um, but people move, one, they move from buying services to buying goods. So they stopped going out to dinner or to movies or taking vacations and they ended up buying products. Uh, and then they ended up buying particular products. Some were to adjust to life uh, more in, in your homes or in your apartments. So they started buying you know, new computers and smartphones and the like. They changed you know, their, their business suits, though you look very nice in your full tie. Lots of people instead bought you know, leisure wear and, and things that they could, they could wear around. Um, many people bought uh, things for their homes because they're spending more time in their homes. So all kinds of refrigerators and other kinds of appliances, uh, lots of construction materials because they're building an addition or fixing things up. Those things became in shorter supply. And so what we saw was what had once been bought experiences and services became buying physical goods. Um, we saw a big shift from stores, physical stores to online, at least a good part of it. Um, but this has been the big change. And, you know, we're not through COVID yet, obviously, as it still goes across the United States. But there is some expectation by economists, we'll see, um, that when we have sort of a more normalized economy, that we would see people go back to spending more on services and this demand for physical products that need to move through supply chains will, will fade a bit or go back to a level closer to where it was before we saw COVID arrive. Well, a lot of those people who were at home. Uh, weren't employed. Uh, so where did they get the money to uh, uh, fuel the spike in demand that you wrote about? I mean, this is the other big part. So a big part is that the U.S. government, unlike 2009 when the financial crisis hit, the U.S. government stepped in with a huge stimulus. You had individual checks for people, right? That went straight to their bank accounts. You had PPP loans for small businesses, medium-sized businesses, making sure that those businesses stayed afloat and kept many employees that they wouldn't have if they had closed. So you've had a, you know, a huge stimulus that hit. So actually the average worker, the average American has a few hundred dollars more in their savings account than they did before COVID, uh, in part because of the support of, of the US government during these very tough times. And then if you look at these last year, um, we actually have seen a surge in employment again. We've seen lots of people coming back into the workforce. We've seen a surge in entrepreneurship and people starting companies in ways that they hadn't for a couple of decades. So you're starting to see, and as we've all seen, there has become a, a worker shortage. So wages have been going up as well. So there's a lot of factors here, but the first one, I think fundamental one was the US government stepped in and, and saved businesses and also saved families from having to make those hard choices. And so that allowed this purchasing to go on. That's the CARES Act, upward of a trillion dollars. Uh, so, all right, I have money in my savings account and uh, why don't I sit there and, uh, and watch it grow? Why do I uh, and, and keep it for a rainy day? Why do I go out on, on Amazon and buy comfy clothes so I can stay at home and, uh, and do very little? Well, you know, the American pastime is buying things, right? So that's part of it. You know, we have seen savings go up or, or really conversely, we have seen debt go down in households. So many people, many families use that money to reduce their overall debt load or to increase their savings. So that did happen. Um, we have also seen some people needed to buy things um, for their new job. So, you know, the new computer that you needed uh, or your or schools needed for kids that were working remotely, those actually were purchases that were really necessary given, given the change in, in the way we were working or the way we were going to school. Um, some of the others were, you know, when they felt like they had money that the, in their bank accounts that they could do the things that they'd always wanted to do. You wanted to build onto your house and you were going to be home uh, more than you had in the past. So there's, I think there's a lot of reasons here um, why people stepped in. And as you mentioned, while the stock market isn't doing very well right now, it was doing incredibly well over the last two years. So I think people felt like they had a lot more money than they had had previously. And, and you know, this wouldn't be the first time that when you you feel that you have more money, whether it's paper or not, um, you go out and buy some of those things you've always looked for. <laughs> well, after you wrote your uh, foreign affairs article, uh, China, and when you talk about the global economy, you always wind up talking about China. Uh, 
which is the home to about one third of uh, global manufacturing, announced that they were at least uh, limiting uh, the, their four largest ports, that there would be COVID lockdowns or limited COVID lockdowns at Shanghai, Shenzhen, Dalian, and Tianjin, and narrowly targeted uh, lockdowns, which may be expanded. Now, if they expand those, it would have a profound effect on uh, the global economy, and that would be due to COVID, indeed due to uh, Omicron, which they uh, say is going to be behind us soon and uh, where the uh, impact on health does not seem to be so great. So if you look back at 2021, if to me the biggest factor causing supply chain snarls was demand and this huge increase in demand, as you look at 2022, I think one of the biggest challenges is going to be the supply constraints, and it's particularly China. So China did shut down uh, significantly in those very first couple of months of COVID, when you look back at March 2022 and in that spring. But then they really opened back up. And you, as you mentioned, you know, last year we saw China's trade with the world increase by almost a third. It really was this manufacturing powerhouse that, that serviced all of the you know, US, Europeans, and other people around the world who were buying so many things. Now, as we look at the beginning of this year, we have Omicron, uh, which you know, for China, which has had this zero COVID policy, they're not just trying to manage it, they're trying to get rid of it or stop it. Uh, there's also questions about whether the Chinese vaccine actually works against Omicron. Uh, it's not an mRNA vaccine, it's an old school vaccine, and there's questions about whether it has, it's effective uh, against the disease. So there's a real question there. And so we have seen China close the ports you mentioned, we've seen them close factories, uh, we've seen them stop people from moving around the country, um, and that has begun to hit supply. So we've seen apparel makers shutting their factories, Volkswagen and Toyota both said that some of their factories have been shut down because of the, where they're located uh, and the challenges there in terms of the disease spreading. Um, there's a real question about whether migrant workers who fill a lot of these factories will be able to come and go. Uh, to, you know, it's almost Chinese Lunar New Year, and usually they go back to their families and come back. There's a real question about whether they would be able to return to the factories. That, too, would put a supply challenge on. Uh, and we've seen China really shut down travel in and out of the country. There's lots of stories of Vietnamese vegetables that aren't able to come across the border into China. Uh, and most of the international flights have been canceled, particularly between China and the United States, Europe, and other places. So all of this, to me, suggests as we look over the next few months, we'll see a real supply challenge and constraint here, as well as transportation shocks when the ports close and the like, that will continue to lead to these snarls in supply chains that we've seen over the last couple of years. What about the darling of high-tech uh, industry, semiconductors? Uh, what's changed uh, with semiconductors uh, since COVID? This is in part the challenge here, and this has to do with COVID. Um, and the real demand for semiconductors. Everybody wanted a new laptop and everybody wanted a new computer and lots of people wanted new cars and all kinds of stuff that semiconductors are part of. But part of it also reflects not COVID, but the way our lives have changed and the number of things that we use every day that have semiconductors in it. And you know, from our refrigerators to our blenders, not just the, the fancy technologies, but the ev little everyday technologies, they increasingly use semiconductors. And so the demand for semiconductors has increased substantially, even as capacity has been a little bit slower to catch up. And so that's part of it. And you know, this would take me from COVID definitely made supply chain struggle. We've seen the hiccups, we've seen the problems in the places where they were vulnerable and where they sometimes broke and were unable to get things to the shelves. But I would say that I think as we look forward, you know, COVID is something that has hit it and is uh, is temporal. It seems to be lasting much longer than any of us want it to. But um, you can imagine a time when COVID would no longer be hitting supply chains. And there, I think it's other issues that are going to matter. And so we're not out of the woods. We're going to start seeing challenges to supply chains. And semiconductors are a perfect example because I think the number one biggest challenge for supply chains in the medium to long term is government policies and how governments shape the incentives um, and sometimes the punishments for where you put your manufacturing or where you source parts from or where you sell things to. And semiconductors as this you know, input to almost everything that we use today or anything that has any technology 
We see very concentrated locations today. You know, Taiwan is the center of all of this and produces the vast majority of, of semiconductors. And we also see a huge amount of government policy and intervention uh, to try to bring supply chains home, to make sure, particularly in semiconductors. So we see the United States talking about a CHIPS Act where it invest over $50 billion to have more uh, supply chain um, places that fabricate supply chains, make supply chains here in the United States. Europe is talking about a similar one. Israel is talking about it. Japan, everybody wants to have their own, uh, own semiconductor uh, making facilities and production facilities. And so that is all about government policy. And so as we look at that supply chain in the future, like many others, what governments decide to do will probably be a bigger decision making or part of a, the decision making process than just the supply and demand that's out there in the market. Uh, well, in the Trump years, uh, we increased uh, export, uh, we increased tariffs on uh, semiconductors, at least from China, and uh, to a very high level. And also we uh, restricted, if not totally banned, exports of semiconductors to China. Now, what's the impact of this on the, the, the world economy? We did. So you see that semiconductors has been an industry that has always been, the governments have always been involved. And so, you know, Taiwan, South Korea, China, even the United States for decades, we've seen a lot of government subsidies or uh, tax breaks or other kinds of things to bring semiconductor manufacturing or research and development home. What we've seen since 2018, more or less, as we saw, as you mentioned, saw high tariffs. We've seen export controls on the actual semiconductors, but also on the machinery that makes semiconductors and particularly vis-a-vis -vis China. So, so what has that meant? Well, it has meant that China has been unable to get a lot of the manufacturing or the machinery to make semiconductors. So you don't see the production that you might've seen out of China. It means that semiconductors that are made in China aren't going to be sold to other parts of the world. So it, it changes those market dynamics. It's not as free and open as it was in the past. And it really puts sort of ring fencing around different places that make semiconductors and make different parts of it. So it divides up the market and it takes it away from sort of a profit and loss focused business to one that is really has heavy involvement by governments. Now, if you, when you think about the national security concerns here, and there are national security concerns, who owns this technology, who uses the technology, what do they use it for? Um, then there's probably, you know, some sense behind why you would divide up, why you would make sure that you as a country have access to semiconductors or you have particular patents or, or control. Um, but if you actually wanna make sure there's semiconductors that go into all the cars that we wanna buy, or you wanna stop these supply chain snarls, this, uh, these prohibitions on selling to particular countries or trading with particular countries in this very you know, fundamental part of most electronics makes it, makes it really difficult and adds, to, and adds to the difficulties of getting things. So, so this is one area. And what you are seeing is governments interested not just in semiconductors, but a whole host of technologies and a whole host of products where they want to get involved and, and bring it bring it home, you know, reshore or nearshore. Uh, and that's where I see many nations going as we look forward and come out of the COVID crisis. Um, we will still see a lot of government involvement in all kinds of supply chains. Uh, what about an environmental policy? Uh, we haven't really touched on that. Uh, government regulation of uh, solar panels, of other uh, environmental uh, tools. Uh, has this had an impact as well? This does too, and it, it can cut both ways. You saw the infrastructure bill that was passed last fall that's now just coming, you know, will be coming into um, appropriations and we'll start seeing spread money around the United States. It has a lot of money to build, for instance, electric vehicle charging stations. It has money to provide credits for you to buy an electric vehicle. So those are, on the whole, will will increase that industry. Right? We'll make it easier to buy an electric car, make it cheaper, and also make it easier to drive one because you'll have somewhere to, to plug it in. Um, so there are some things governments are doing to encourage a green transition and to make those businesses more profitable. On the other side, you also see governments very concerned about controlling the technology behind the green transition, right? They're just as we, they want to have control over semiconductors and have those made in their, you know, on their land and, and within their boundaries. Um, they care too about, you know, things like green and blue hydrogen or solar panels or some of the technology behind there wanting to bring those home. So you see a mix of 
you know, tariffs or potentially export controls or other kinds of things to try to keep that technology or that knowledge and expertise uh, in, in particular places. So there, I think we're gonna start seeing uh, as well, we'll see support and, and perhaps a flowering of those industries or a growing of, of some of the knowledge and, and research and development um, that in ways that only governments can really support, sort of getting R&D out there and, and having basic research happen. Um, but we may also see real divisions on, on sort of the challenge of who benefits and also uh, where that information goes, where that technology goes that won't be as free and open as, as many other things that we might sell. And that will slow, I think, the adoption of you know, solar panels and wind turbines and things when there's high tariffs on, on those coming in from other countries versus those that are made at home, for instance. You see uh, governments, uh, particularly uh, the United States government, doing anything to correct these uh, supply and demand imbalances? We do see the government stepping up in what they deem critical areas. So semiconductors is one of them, and we see lots of bills going through or, or a focus on trying to increase that. We see it in electric vehicle batteries, so the technology behind electric vehicles. There's lots of talk about particular critical minerals, things like rare earths or other particular minerals that are, that are vital. Um, and we've also seen the government step in in areas around pharmaceuticals, right, on access to the vaccine, on access to other critical medicines, stockpiling or, or trying to make sure that capacity happens here, that those N95 masks are made here in the United States and, and not just in China. So I do see the government stepping in. But, you know, one lesson I would take from all of this last two years is Yes, there are particular parts of the supermarket that are empty, or yes, it's been hard for automakers to get uh, semiconductors to put into their new cars. But overall, in the face of huge demand shocks, supply shocks, logistic shocks, all of this, supply chains functioned rather well. Uh, and we saw things come back, even with heightened demand, even with these challenges, we saw things come back pretty quickly within weeks or within a few months. Um, so I don't know if you remember the great toilet paper scare of March 2020. It was all over a couple months later, right? And we had a, you know, missing masks here uh, in the United States. And, you know, just two months later, China was making each month more masks than were used around the whole world the year before. So, and they, and they also went to all countries all over the world. So what I think we have seen, actually, I would hate for us to take the wrong lesson from these last two years where we haven't seen a few things in the supermarket is that actually these supply chains in many ways made us more resilient rather than less resilient if we had done it all at home. Okay, and we also have uh, the infrastructure bill, uh, the government addressing the question of uh, ports, modernizing ports uh, and uh, uh, our whole uh, trucking industry uh, and trying to bring truckers back to work and uh, making life a little easier for them. But I have a question for you, Shannon O'Neill. Do you see this supply chain shortage and, you, the, and its consequent inflation ending anytime soon? So I can I go out and buy stock? <laughs> stock in what? That's the question, right? <laughs> so I do think some of this will lessen. Uh, and I think it will lessen in 22 for a variety of reasons. You know, this, this first few months, I think, will be difficult because of what's happening in China. They're just getting hit with the kinds of things that we've been dealing here at the United States over the last couple of years in terms of the disease and, and the effects on people there. So it's not going to happen soon. But I think as we look toward the end of this year, hopefully COVID will become more endemic than pandemic. We'll, we'll know how to deal with it. Um, we have made improvements in some of the logistics and some of that money from the infrastructure Structure bill will start to improve our ports and our railroads and our roads and bridges and things that will, you know, our infrastructure hasn't really been invested in, at least not enough since the 1980s. So finally, we're getting there and investing. That will make a difference here in the United States. Um, but I, and the other, the biggest part, I think, is that people will start spending money on different things, right? They'll have enough laptops, they'll have enough cozy clothes, and they'll have built, you know, new parts to their house, and they'll go back to doing things, getting out and, and, and doing things around the world um, or here in the United States. And so I think that will also make a big difference. So I think, yes, we will start seeing some of these supply chains hiccups lessen, um, but other things, because governments in particular areas, because governments 
are intervening because they have other goals there. They care about the environment. They want to make a faster transition to a green economy. Um, they care about national security issues. They want to make sure the laptop you buy is safe and no one's tampering with it or has a backdoor in to do something harmful to you know to you or to your utility system or, or pipeline grids and the like. Um, there are other reasons why they're intervening and that will on the whole, I think, slow some of these supply chains, make it harder to, to recover, even though it may provide resilience against other things than just the ability to have things on shelves. Okay, so our takeaway is more endemic than pandemic to come in the future. Shannon O'Neill, thank you so much for coming by. This has been just marvelous. And thank you for coming by. Uh, please don't miss Shannon's book out very soon called the Globalization Myth, Supply Chains, Economic Integration, and Why Regions Matter out later this year. Uh, don't miss that book. Visit our website, please, jimzironconversations.com. Take care, stay safe, and all the best.